This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you for your silence. We're going to have to be, you're going to have to be very quiet, and I'm going to have to be very loud, because we don't have our sound system up right now. But we are still able to offer our tributes to Dan. Um, and it's my great privilege to offer a toast, which will be the instigation for a set of tributes this evening. And I'd like to ask the first group of tri tributers to <laughs> assemble right here behind me so that we can proceed with our tributing. Um, we will hear from our fellow celebrators some personal tributes over the course of our meal together. And I will be bringing those who are offering tributes to this podium in groups over the next hour. So this is our first group. But I want to get us started here with an actual toast. We can't be toasting so many times in a row. <laughs> so we're allowed one toast. We're allowed one actual toast. And that's my great privilege to be able to offer to Dan. So please find your glass. And I hope it has something in it. OK. This weekend, Dan is standing for the value, the past significance, and I think also the future impact of literary study. And that's an indication of the community that we live in, because students come through here all the time observing the activities that we might be using to promote the, especially the humanities in the College of Arts and Sciences. Each of us is indebted to Dan in local ways, many of which you're about to hear um, from our fellow celebrants shortly. But all of us are indebted here collectively in a way which carries forward to Dan's commitment, to Dan's passion, to his values, in his ongoing scene of engagement and contribution to teaching, <coughs> reading, thinking, to knowledge and creativity. It's an immense scene, and we're representing it right now, just in terms of the scope and diversity and generational um, scenario that's represented in this room. So Dan's commitment to um, all of these values is what we're toasting here tonight in a kind of collective affirmation of Dan Schwartz and of what we together represent, value, and seek to carry forward. So please join me in raising our glasses to our teacher, our mentor, our friend, Dan Schwartz. Here, here, here. Now we'll hear and have a sip. Now we will hear a set of tributes, and I'll ask each of our, our tributors to start with their name and offer their tribute. I'm Pete Weatherby, and if I have any distinction, um, I certainly don't pretend to expertise in any of Dan's fields, which I guess makes me a very narrow person because he has expertise in a lot of fields. But I am somebody who was here when, when Dan came 50 years ago. We, we, we were assistant professors together and uh, played a little touch football, a little softball, and so forth. And, uh, and I'm very happy to be here tonight. I'll try and be as brief as I was told to be. Uh, like, like Laura, I'm, I'm tremendously impressed by the scope and the evolution of Dan's vision as a teacher and scholar and in the range of the subjects that he's chosen to write about. When I say teacher and scholar, I realize that those are not adequate terms. I mean, Dan is a teacher, but, uh, but he is much more, in the, the best sense of the word, a mentor. I mean, somebody whose relationship with his students and the seriousness with which he regards them can be, and has been for many students, the most important thing um, about their time at Cornell. 
And Scholar hardly does justice to his professional role. He is somebody who is right out there in the world doing intellectual things. But evolution, I think, gets it right. I mean, Dan has evolved steadily since the years when we were both scrambling for tenure, not just publishing or, or adding new courses to his repertoire, but he's thought hard about teaching, what it's for, what it can mean. His dedication to his students is an example for all of us, and it extends well beyond the conventional classroom. There's a tendency to teach as though all one's students were training to be English teachers. And this inevitably narrows the goal of a class, and uh, at worst, it can amount to treating them as what uh, Emerson might have called remote and inferior incarnations of oneself. Um, Dan thinks about his students as people in their own right. He has a clear awareness of what is at stake for them from the moment they enter college to their departure for the larger world. He works hard to help them recognize the possibilities open to them, and I've heard enough from his students over the years to know that his efforts are greatly appreciated and sometimes truly transformative. He understands how large a part of teaching consists of what we ordinarily call advising, and his advice is based on hard thought. We all think we care about these things, but very few of us have thought through what it means to teach the humanities, their value, their role in a student's maturation, why a student should or shouldn't consider graduate school in the humanities, how one's humanities background can help him in other areas. Dan is his own best example of how a trained academic can broaden his horizons, um, although he has done this for many other people too. To look through Dan's CV, as some of you may have done, it's, uh, it takes a while, um, is uh, to be humbled. I mean, um, his is several times longer than mine and covers an incredible range of different kinds of participation in the scholarly, the humanistic, the intellectual world. And, and Dan is versatile. I mean, beginning with his early work on Benjamin Disraeli, he's done a great deal with Jewish topics including, but by no means limited to, the Holocaust. He's a New Yorker to the bone, which unfortunately means a Yankee fan. But uh, uh, this gives an extra authenticity to his wonderful writing on Damon Runyon and his extraordinary work on The Times, where he became, what, a kind of sub-editor or something like that for a while. And, uh, and uh, his, well, never mind the Yankees. And literary criticism, of course, is still there. I mean, he's done all these other things, but he is still a literary critic, still high energy. In his middle 70s, when some of us might think we had reached our golden years and were entitled to uh, lay back a little, Dan has started a new book that will help place all sorts of readers from all of um, writers from all over the world, some of them little known, at least to me, um, some hot off the press. Dan has too much class to be what he himself might call a wise guy, but he knows the ropes, and he has become as much of a public intellectual as any colleague I can think of. His extraordinary body of work reflects 50 years of careful reading, dedicated teaching, but most significantly, and to this I offer my toast, most significantly a prodigious intellectual energy and a rich wisdom about what a humanist can accomplish in the world. My name again is Peter Fortunato. Dan, I've written you a poem. For Dan Schwartz at 50, Thought is the thought of thought, thinks one Stephen D, thinking of old Aristotle and thinking he does much in that novel, Ulysses. A building block, you know the vintage, talisman for a young Daedalus such as I, wording myself up, lifted with the help of a mentor who cracked the rebus into portions for us students round his table. GS 236, I think it was. 
And by his table, I mean Dan's seminar, of course. Salute, amico mio. Felice anniversario. Fifty years. Just about the length of our friendship. Setting forth tonight from this shore, I think how in this hall, among so many friends, our moment of shared thinking is compounded. And how, shipping outward, looking back, we will be bound as when returning to a well-loved page to savor substance all the more, remembering ourselves both then and now. So, to that porpoise, ah, my thoughts are leaping far above Cayuga's waters. To enjoy another musing, I refer to chapter three. Two midwives on a strand, and one whose bag our Stephen notes lugs out to sea, a misbirth with a trailing navel cord hushed in ruddy wool. Death in life. But life, creation from nothing, indeed, indeed. It's literature, yes, yes, Dan, that we will always love. The cords of all link back, strand entwining cable of all flesh. That is why, mystic monks, will you be as gods, gaze in your own phallos. Is this Joycean irony or plain fact? All times embodied in us, and we are never not connected to our source. God bless us now, and give us another think. Hello, Kinch here. Put me on to Edenville. Aleph, Alpha, Not, Not, One. I'm Diane Richard Allardyce, and Dan, I've uh, addressed my tribute to you directly. So, um, Dan, a quarter century ago, I guess right at the midpoint of your 50-year teaching career that we're celebrating tonight, I applied for your 1993 NEH summer seminar, Critical and Theoretical Perspectives on the Modernist Tradition. The seminar description had caught my attention on several levels. In particular, your term, mindscapes, really fascinated me. When you called a few weeks later to invite me to the seminar, I felt an instant connection to the voice on the other line. And when the 12 of us emerging scholars gathered in person around the conference table here at Cornell, I knew we had all found in each other true kindred spirits. Over that seven weeks, and it was certainly a transformative seven weeks. You showed us new ways of seeing, how to apply the critical lenses of literary interpretation to works of modern art. You showed us how responding to art and poetry involved the intersection of perceptual planes and how the processes of knowing, thinking, and creating are inextricably woven. You encouraged us to think of ourselves as public intellectuals. Your melding of the visual, the act of seeing itself with the more theoretical aspects of the humanities will always be important to me. Over the last 25 years, I've referred often to your work, cited you, quoted you, paraphrased you in my own teaching. Your mindscapes are writ large on the backdrop of my imagination where they will continue to inform my perspectives for what I hope will be at least another quarter century. Dan, thank you and congratulations. I'm Betty Kirstein. Of all the professors I had as an undergraduate at Cornell in the late 70s, Dan Schwartz was my favorite the only one with whom I've stayed in touch. 
I took an early 20th century British Lit class with him, and I still remember his engaging lectures on Hardy's Jude the Obscure and Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man, among any of many other wonderful novels that we covered that semester. I kept my red covered notebook with my precious notes on his lectures for many years, not realizing that I would return to them many years later when I taught my own version of the same class at Pace University, where I'm an English professor. But Dan was more than just a professor to me. He was my advisor, and in that capacity, he listened to my ups, my downs. I believe he even gave me boyfriend advice. <laughs> One moment that I particularly remember <clears throat> is when I arrived at his office for an appointment only to be greeted by the announcement that he had to run an errand and therefore he would be conducting our uh, meeting peripatetically. I'm not sure I knew what that word was then. Just as Socrates had done with his students, and so we walked to the Cornell campus, our Athens, and we talked about whatever it was that we needed to discuss. I'm sure some of that was literature. But it's Dan's enthusiasm for his subject, British literature, that stands out most in my mind. He was an inspiration to my own career, and I'm very happy to be there this weekend to honor him to celebrate his 50 years at Cornell. Congratulations, Dan. My name is Bill Thixton. Dan was my dissertation advisor from 1981 to 1984. And for the last 32 years, I've been a recovering academic. And I'm here to represent all the other recovering academics uh, not present today. Um, I did, for 30 years, uh, I have done work as a database uh, expert and consultant. And I've had a, a hobby. Um, of, of politics, which uh, in the last two years has gotten completely out of control uh, when I became chair of my county democratic committee up in Oneida County, two hours northeast of here. So in fall 1980, I took Dan's Conrad Lawrence and Joyce seminar. And in January 1981, I was still working on my incomplete from that course when uh, it occurred to me that the ending of Ulysses was like the ending of four other modernist novels, and that this might possibly even be a dissertation topic. And finally, in, in June, when The Incomplete was actually still outstanding, I nevertheless got up the nerve to go talk to Dan about whether this might possibly be a dissertation that he would like to advise. And The Incomplete notwithstanding, uh, he, he embraced the project enthusiastically, and our, our relationship began. Now, he took me on basically on spec, because he had not seen the paper yet. And he did not indeed see the paper for another 18 months after that, which is how long it took me to produce my first chapter. Uh, Dan and I talked a lot about the fact that during, during, during that time that he was the same age then as Leopold Bloom. And I was essentially the same age, maybe a year or two older, as Stephen Dedalus. And our relationship was a little bit like that. And now looking back on it, I see that, that in many other ways it was like that. Uh, we had a brief encounter in the middle of Dan's 50-year career, a little closer to the beginning than to the end, and then, and, then, and then we moved on. What Dan had to offer was exactly what I needed. I'm a bit of a procrastinator, a bit of a perfectionist. I always wanted each sentence to be perfect before I wrote the next sentence. Dan's idea was you just wrote a whole bunch of stuff, and, and, then, you, and then you made it better. And he, sa he said to me once that, that his day was, was from 6 to 9 a.m. every day he, he did writing. And then he came to campus and, and taught from 9 to 5, a full, a full day's work as a teacher. He said, but you know, if you write for three hours every day, you get a lot of writing done. <laughs> and uh, 19 books later, I, I guess that's, that's proven to be true. A couple of things that I think are, are direct quotes. Uh, Dan once said he didn't take a day off on the weekend because, well, you know, most of us waste at least 24 hours somewhere in the course of the week anyway, so why should we need, why should we need a day of rest? Uh, and, and another one I liked was um, most academics don't work very hard compared to people in business and finance, which is, is, is maybe true of people in business and finance now that I've seen some more of the world. Maybe it was true of some academics in those days, but it was never true of Dan. Uh, Dan was tenacious and remorseless as a dissertation advisor. He was generous with his time and he was endless in his expectations. He expected all of his students to become experts in the history and theory of the novel. 
even those like me who came in as experts in another field. I was a romanticist for my first three years here. I also have to talk just briefly, because it hasn't really been touched on yet, and maybe others will later. We had a group in those days that was known on campus and in the department as the Sons of Dan. And Dan met every two weeks with all of his advisees. He alluded to this briefly during, during his remarks earlier. And every semester, we would read one or two theoretical books and discuss them. And sometimes we would strategize about the academic job market, which was almost as miserable then as it is now. And every month or so, one of his students who was writing dissertation, maybe every couple of months, one of us would get to present on our dissertation to the group. And the thing about that is you actually had to have something to present. <laughs> it's one thing to be embarrassed in front of your advisor because you've been working on the first chapter for 18 months, but if you ask you to present to a group of your peers, you really, you've really got to produce something. The other advantage of meeting with Dan every two weeks is that there was just no way to hide from your advisor. I mean, you saw him every two weeks, you know? I mean, you couldn't, like, go hang out in the library. You, you couldn't disappear from campus for a month at a time because, you know, Dan was, like, in your face. Where were you? Why did you miss the session? We talked about this great book. <laughs> we missed your perspective. <clears throat> so 18 months for the first chapter, six months for the second, two months for the third. So there was a kind of a trajectory to this project. And, and I think almost all of the push for my dissertation to get completed came from Dan. The other thing that happened right at the same time that I started my dissertation was that Terac Microcomputers came to Cornell. And Dan was one of the few faculty members, I think Jonathan Culler was another, who learned the microcomputer right along with, with those of us who are graduate students. And we talked about how to write on a word processor and what a great thing it was. And that also, of course, helped to pave the way for my second career because I was an enthusiast about computers coming out of Cornell, which most humanists weren't at that, at that stage in, in, in time. I don't think I would have completed the dissertation with a different advisor, and I also know I wouldn't have published it. Dan was so generous at, at, that he spoke to his publisher in London when he was there, got her to solicit my book, and uh, it, it was published in 1988. And I'm here to tell you that it is much better to be a non-practicing academic with a PhD and a book than it is to be a non-practicing ABD. I've known plenty of both kinds of people, and I'd much rather be this kind. <laughs> so I thank Dan for all of it, um, and I'm, I've become sort of the poster boy for the liberal arts uh, with, with my career in computers and my third career in, in politics, and, and a lot of this uh, is attributable to, to Dan's push and his drive and his effort uh, to get me to, to really to do hard work. So thanks, Dan. I'm going to read two more tributes from friends who could not be here, but were so eager to make sure their words were heard that they sent them in to us. This is from Cheryl Weissman, a PhD student of Dan's from 1981. As one of the original sons of Dan, I was a student for whom he was exactly the right mentor. He became my committee chair at the reservoir on a summer day when we passed in the woods on the path to go swimming. I said hello, and he announced, Cheryl, now that you've passed your Q exam, you need to form your thesis committee. I will be your chair. <laughs> I came to his office with an inchoate idea for a thesis about the mystical quality I had observed in several 19th century authors' final novels. He said, Cheryl, forget it. You wouldn't want to take on the scholarship needed to, for multiple authors. Write on Jane Austen. She's going to be big. <laughs> I said, Dan, I don't particularly like Jane Austen. He said, that's OK. You'll write on her. <laughs> that directive voice was exactly what I needed. I did have something to say about Austin's final novel, Persuasion, and this something emerged fully illuminated in the context of her whole canon. Happily, only five other novels. Dan had called it with apt foresight. Directiveness, a good heart, and a fine ear for another person's inner voice. Dan was both the scholar and the coach I needed to see the task through. 
I published the best of the chapters as an essay in the Kenyan Review, and it was later included in the Norton Critical Edition of Persuasion. Though my career path has led away from academia, I am glad and proud that my voice has joined the chorus of scholars on Jane Austen. Last year, I wrote Dan to thank him for coaching me to complete the thesis and steering me in such a prescient direction. The popular attention to Jane Austen that arose in the 1990s was stunning. How did he know her star was going to, was going to blaze? Not prescience, he replied. He had simply recognized an available niche for, for Austen scholarship at the time. He went on to amaze me with affectionate and spot on recollections of the classmates in my cohort. Prolific scholar and author though he is, his teaching has always seemed to take precedence and we, his students, have always cherished him. Thank you, Dan, for being such a wonderful coach and mentor to me. Your guidance has deeply enriched my life. <laughs> and finally, from Abigail Abby Cohn, who is a professor at Cornell in our college and a colleague, and who was an undergraduate student of Dan's. I'm so sorry not to be able to be, not to be here joining in this joyous celebration, but I didn't want to let the occasion slip by without extending my congratulations and best wishes on this momentous occasion. Few of us will have had the profound impact Dan has had on generations and generations of students, and fewer of us still will have sustained anything approaching the energy, engagement, insight, and impact that Dan has had through his teaching over the past 50 years. I had the pleasure of studying with Dan during my undergraduate days as an English major in the late 70s. While I don't remember all the details of Dan's early 20th century British and Irish literature class, I remember a lot of it. I remember reading Hardy, Forster, Conrad, and of course, Joyce. Dan guided us through a close reading of the text using a lens of intellectual history that brought both the authors and their works to life. I also remember being in awe of how Dan knew all of, all of our names and could carry on a discussion in a class of 90 students. I knew at the time that this was an impressive feat, but it wasn't until I myself started teaching that I understood just how remarkable this was. Coming back to Cornell in 1989 as a linguistics professor, it was an honor to find myself as a colleague of Dan's. I have continued to draw inspiration from having been a student of Dan's, both in terms of what and how he taught. Dan was among the faculty who seemed well established to me as a 20 year old, in his mid 30s at the time, and seemed not to have aged during the dozen years I had been gone. And now, almost 30 years since I returned, his vibrant energy and the contagious twinkle of his eyes make it hard to believe that he's been here 40 years since I studied with Dan and 50 years since he first started teaching at Cornell. We are all the richer for it. And in the last few years, it has been a pleasure to vicariously enjoy Dan's teaching again as my daughter, now an English major at Cornell, has also studied with Dan including a course on the high modernist tradition, reading many of the same works I had the pleasure of reading with Dan. Thank you, Dan. I suggest you, you enjoy your desserts, and then we'll be back shortly with another small group of tributaries. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Elon Kaplan. I just graduated uh, in the spring of last year. Um, so when I was thinking about what I should say when I came up here uh, about Dan Schwartz, uh, I kind of thought about what my experience as an undergraduate was or what the undergraduate experience in uh, the years of 2012 to 2017 were. And they're obviously the uh, class dinners with Dan and Marsha. They're the uh, classic, iconic Bostagrams. Um, running into Professor Schwartz at Tegel, uh, and while you're going to work out, and he's coming from working out, uh, stopping and having a 20 minute chat, um, just in the Tegel hallways, while the uh, swim team walks by shirtless. Um, uh, a lot of the highlights of working here with uh, Professor Schwartz. I took two classes 
with Dan, uh, both on modernism, the modernist tradition, and Ulysses. Uh, one of the books we read was The Dubliners, which uh, was a book that dealt with paralysis, uh, the, one of the major themes. Uh, I myself, during my undergraduate career, had my own bouts with being paralyzed in the moment. Um, I didn't have the easiest time going through college uh, or graduating. I, I took a couple of extra years. Um, I didn't do my work or I skipped class uh, and I never reached out for help from anyone. Um, it, it brings to mind for me a phrase that uh, Dan has hammered into my head uh, from Conrad. Uh, we live as we dream, alone. Um, Though Professor Schwartz teaches Heart of Darkness, uh, he is a humanist more than he is a modernist, and I don't think he really believes that we live and dream alone. And um, one moment I had when I was taking his class, Ulysses, uh, I had a moment of paralysis, and I missed a class, and Dan reached out to me. He said, where are you? We want to make sure you come to the next class. Uh, I was embarrassed, and I ignored that email. Um, and I missed another class. Again, Dan reached out, even though I had ignored the first email. I ignored that one, too. I was embarrassed. I didn't know what to say. I, I didn't know how to fix it. Uh, the weekend before our class that week, Dan emailed me, and he said, Elon, just come to class. We'll figure it out. Uh, so I went. Uh, and I got to him in the hallway before we got to class, and he said to me, Elon, where the hell have you been? <laughs> um, and I told him I wanted to talk to him about it after class. Uh, and he said, sure, of course. He had obviously just been talking to other students, so we needed to make sure we got to class on time. And after that class, um, we spoke about what was going on with me uh, in my life, um, about how to get back into my academic career, how to move forward. Um, so Professor Schwartz reached into the miasma of my undergraduate uh, melancholy and moroseness, and he pulled me back up. Uh, in order to delve into the miasma of Ulysses. Um, Dan says one of the cornerstones of modernism is uh, a person's inability to truly understand another person, that loneliness. I think that one of the cornerstones is actually a person's inability to truly ever understand Ulysses. Um, I did pass Professor Schwartz's class uh, with an A, Minus. Um, I did graduate Cornell um, last spring uh, to send one of my own Bostagrams with Dan's help, uh, with a recommendation and a lot of encouragement. I uh, applied to and was accepted for a master's in fine arts in acting, uh, where I'll be starting in the fall um, at the Actor Studio Drama School. And that's what I always wanted to do. So uh, I want to say thank you for helping me. I mean, just for really walking the walk. Um, when we heard Dan talk earlier about being the professor who talks to students and who asks questions, uh, nothing could have hit more close to home uh, and more truthfully for me. So thank you. Hello, my name is Marvin Carlson. Uh, I'm going to just say a few words about an aspect of Dan that has not been spoken very much about directly. Uh, not unreasonably, the emphasis is on uh, Dan's work and his influence, which has been enormous as a teacher, and of course that's the title of this convention. I never knew Dan as a teacher, at least not in the conventional sense of the word, uh, but I knew him in 
another aspect of his career here, which I think really is of equal scope, depth, and importance, and that is his work as a colleague. Uh, I, many of you have had the same experience I have of knowing Dan for many years, like, uh, like another wonderful longtime friend, Pete, who started. Uh, we all came about the same time, uh, and I overlapped. I had the good fortune to uh, overlap with Dan for the first 20 years of my career here. Uh, at that time, uh, I was uh, in, the, uh, in the theater program here and, and executive officer for a number of years. Uh, this was my major contact, especially at the beginning with Dan, uh, in, uh, in Professor McLean's wonderful and wide-ranging introduction. I did note that he mentioned Dan's interest in art, music, and literature, but not theater. Uh, and I want to take care of that at this moment, that Dan is a, a great aficionado of theater, as he is of so many arts and human activities. Uh, he regularly attended the University Theater. I can't think of how many times uh, he and I have discussed uh, at length uh, the, the, the work of the University Theater, and for that matter, the work of the University Theater in the years after I left when I came back and, and continued uh, my conversations with him. Oh, and I might also say, and the theater in New York, because of course, as has been mentioned, uh, another one of his wonderful uh, areas of expertise, interest, and enthusiasm is New York City, which is uh, another great topic. It's hard to think, indeed, of topics that at one time or another our conversations have not covered. Literature, obviously, the theater, uh, the arts, New York City. Not much has been said about his interest in travel and his expertise in that. Uh, and uh, being a great traveler myself, I've loved talking to him about, about his experiences in, in, in other places. Uh, the, uh, uh, what all this says, I guess, is that uh, uh, one of the things that I cherish the most about my 20 years at Cornell was the, the number of really um, interesting collegial people. This is not, or at least in my years, was not a university where people were isolated within particular departments or programs. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of crossover formally and informally, and a lot of wonderful, mutually enriching, ongoing conversations. And certainly high on the list that I have in that area uh, was Dan and his, his participation, his interest in the work I was doing, and in the wonderful conversations we had about it. So for all that, thank you very much, Dan. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Gabrielle McIntyre, and I was Dan Schwartz's reader and teaching assistant for two years in a row, 19, sorry, 2000 to 2001. Um, and I thought I would just tell you a little story about how I first met Dan. Um, I, I currently teach modernism at Queen's University in Canada. I have held on to this syllabus for what, 18 years now. Um, I still find notes that I took in his class that are meaningful and inspiring for how I teach today. So I was assigned to be his reader, um, and I hadn't met him other than very briefly at, at little gatherings in the English department, but this was going to be our first meeting. He said to me, uh, I guess it was an email, come to the class and we'll talk afterward. So it was a beautiful August day, it was hot. There were students everywhere returning to campus, and we had one of the famous peripatetic meetings. Um, I walked outside, and I remember very distinctly, after having heard this lecture, which was really good. I mean, you know, when you're a grad student, you're skeptical of almost everything, and I, I, I thought, this guy is going to be, this is going to be all right. Um, so in our little walk past the 80 White House, he just said to me, I'm going to be your teaching mentor. <laughs> and I, I, I thought, well, okay. Um, it, you know, 
skepticism. Um, it turned out to be exactly true. He was the only professor I, I ever had who really took me under his wing in that way, talked to me about pedagogy, talked to me about what it means to teach, to connect. Um, and I just wanted to say a few things about what I learned from him. I think one of the biggest lessons was that teaching can be, should be a form of play and a, a form of joy. That being with the students, exploring a text, immersing yourself in the literature and the poetry should be joyful, joy-filled. And he made that happen all the time. The other thing I wanted to say is he always took E.M. Forrester's adage, only connect to heart, and I think made it happen, as this, is, this event is testimony to that as well, he made it happen again and again and again in a daily way with countless students. Um, and then lastly, I just want to say how incredibly incisive he always was. He, he played, he le helped us connect, but he was always direct, dead on, incredibly lucid, incredibly helpful, and uh, he's just been an inspiration, continues to be so. So thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Good evening to everyone who's persevered so far. Uh, my name is John Eugene, and I had the honor of taking three of Dan's classes while I was an undergrad here at Cornell and working with him on my undergraduate thesis, so that's a total of five semesters with Dan. Uh, and when I finished at Cornell, uh, Dan's summative statement on working with me may have been that advising me was like herding cats. <laughs> and I may have deserved it, and a latent guilt may be why I'm here and leaving my wife at home with our three children. Uh, but I would like to offer more than a thank you for dealing with my 22-year-old self to Dan tonight because I've spent the last 16 years uh, teaching high school English in Baltimore City. And so with the theme of transformative teaching, uh, I'd like to talk just quickly about what Dan has given me that the 2,500 students that I have taught in my career have gained through me from him. Uh, one thing is that I had the op opportunity for a few years in Baltimore to teach a course in Holocaust literature. And if you know anything about Baltimore, this is a city where relationships between uh, the African American community and the Jewish community are not easy. And teaching a Holocaust literature class to a classroom of entirely African American students was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, that I couldn't have done without Dan's expertise. Uh, the second thing, we know that Dan uh, is fond of a good phrase, uh, and he chooses his phrase as well. And one of the ones that Dan gave me that is stuck is the phrase illuminating distortions. The idea of an illuminating distortion is incredibly useful as we seek to understand ourselves, as we seek to understand complex things like our current apparently nonsensical political climate. Uh, illuminating distortions are everywhere, but they are much more than intellectual. And when I confront my students in Baltimore City with the notion of an illuminating distortion, and they begin to look at their urban context where they've spent a lifetime aware of distortions of power, distortions of justice, distor distortions of identity, and they begin to see those things not as insoluble problems, but see those distortions as illuminating. That's the beginning of their real education. So Dan, from those students, thank you. And thank you for giving me the tools to teach them. Thanks. Hi, my name's Holly Stave. When I tell people that Dan is my mentor, they assume that at some point I must have studied at Cornell, but um, sadly that's not the case. However, in 1988, I was selected to be in Dan's NEH seminar on modernism, and at that point I was a newly minted PhD teaching at a two-year college where the teaching load was indeed heavy, but where I got the sense my colleagues were using that as an excuse to avoid their own research and writing. And there, it was Emory's two-year college, and their idea was, well, on the Atlanta campus they research, we teach. And I didn't like that attitude, but here I was by myself in the rural south, 
trying to wade my way through postmodern theory with no help from them because their idea was it didn't matter anyway. And I was teaching three sections of comp and one section of literature and trying to convince my students that a close reading of a text was not reading too much into a text, which I heard fairly often. And I was trying to convince my colleagues and my administrators that uh, feminist approaches to literature were indeed valid and that literature had always been political, like try reading Antigone. Um, <laughs> So it was a very, very frustrating time for me. I was, at that point, I still am quite shy, but I was very insecure. I came to this seminar, and I think for the, probably the first four weeks I didn't open my mouth, but we had to write. And when we turned in our papers, Dan's praise for my writing was so inspiring and heartening to me. And he took me to lunch and, and he asked about my dissertation. So I had my bestie in Georgia sent it to me and he helped me get it published. But he also was not going to bode any talk about, I teach too much to research. He, he, shut that down for the nonsense he, it was, but he taught by example. He also told me about the fact that he worked on his own research every single day, a practice which I have taken up. And he also um, got me to submit more papers to conferences and actually had, is responsible for making my career. And I think there are other people in here who could make the same claim, that without Dan Schwartz, I would probably still be teaching at a two-year college, teaching four classes of composition a semester, and pulling my hair out. So I raise my glass to you, Dan, as my mentor, my friend, the best teacher I ever had, and just an incredible human being. Here's to you. I'm going to read another tribute from our colleague Barry Strauss, a professor of history at Cornell, and also ask our last tributers to join me so we'll, we'll um, have our culminating tribute moment um, when I'm done reading this from Barry. Dan has played an invaluable role as a mentor during my years at Cornell. I first met Dan in a different role entirely, however. As a Cornell undergrad in the 1970s, I studied history and classics, but I always loved English literature. When I had time as an upperclassman to take an elective, I asked around for a good English course and heard great things about a young professor who taught a seminar on the novel. So I signed up for Dan's course on Conrad Lawrence and Joyce. I don't recall, but I imagine that I had to ask permission and talk my way in. I must have been a good talker, as it was a 4,000 level course. Um, I was a non-major, and I was rather cocky after my high school AP English course. <laughs> but wow, did I ever have a lot to learn. Everything about the course was formidable, from Joyce's difficult prose to the other students, and above all, to the professor. Dan demanded our best from us. It was a literary critical boot camp as far as I'm concerned, and I haven't forgotten the sounds of my metaphorical groaning and grunting nor did I learn anything like, earn anything like my highest grade in college. But I hope I learned how to read with greater sensitivity and grace, and I certainly learned to love the books. I still have most of them, carefully underlined and annotated in the margins on almost every page. Thumbing through them now reminds me of the difference in a student's life that a great teacher can make. Thank you doesn't even begin to convey my gratitude to Dan. I'm there with you all in spirit, and I can't think of anyone who deserves this honor more. From Barry Strauss. So there were a couple of others who wanted to say something, and please do come up and do so now. I'm Kathy Zoller. We are here to honor Dan in his 50th year of teaching. I met Dan in his fourth. I don't feel old at all. I was a 17-year-old faculty brat who thought she could write. And I took his freshman seminar, and I ended up taking two other courses from him as well. And there are certain people that you meet in your life, they collide with you, and you may go separate ways, 
but you know they've made a huge impact on you. And Dan was that for me. He taught me that it's not a sin to scribble in the margins of books. He taught me that I bring as much to a text as the text brings to me. He taught me to love Lawrence and Joyce, Conrad maybe not so much. <laughs> and, uh, and I appreciated every moment of that. I'm sorry that I couldn't make my daughter an English major, but that's the way it goes. Um, and the other thing that I've learned from him, seeing him over these last few years, is that it's possible to have 50 years of a passion for something that's not chocolate. You know, it's just amazing to see him. He doesn't leap on tables anymore, but he's still got the joy, he still brings the love for this topic, no matter what it is. Um, we're thinking of moving house, and I was cleaning up, and I found a few things. A paper on the Prussian officer, one on the horse dealer's daughter, one on the secret agent, and one, of course, on Ulysses. Now, another thing that Dan always told me that I didn't really buy was that the best students are not always the A students. But Professor, it's been 46 years. I think I'm a better writer now. If I do a few revisions, will you change my grades? <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Suzanne Perry, and I was an undergraduate with Professor Schwartz back in the mid-90s. Um, I spent precious little time with him. I didn't discover him till my junior, or I think my senior year. Um, and it didn't have the profound influence on my career that, that I, and a lot of years I think it has had. I'm not as eloquent as um, all of the professors in the room. But I think um, his courses and the things he taught, which I'm still learning 25 years later, um, have enriched my life in ways that um, it's difficult to express. I, I know that um, I've, I, at Cornell, I, I had come to Cornell somewhat sheltered. And um, I think dance class classes and his manner of teaching, his manner of taking us for a pizza or to the art gallery, um, really opened up new worlds. And they're new worlds that have sustained me uh, through 25 years in law and finance, which when I first got to law school, I thought it was going to kill me. And coming, you know, having the experience of pulling things out of art, pulling things out of literature, um, and relating to the world and connecting to the world around me is what kept me grounded and kept me rooted through all of these things and helped me to find my way. Years later, I, I um, picked up a couple of your books to, well, I scoured my bookshelf to figure out what to, to say tonight. And of course, I found many books from your courses, many books of other works of literature that I'd scribbled copiously in the margins scribbles of poetry written on the subway that have helped me keep my sanity during the Trump administration in DC. And um, I just want to say thanks. And, um, and I continue to learn and, and hopefully to teach um, each day. And um, thanks to you and other professors like you. What, what I found on reading your book and succeeding in college and beyond was that I'd done a lot wrong, but you can still turn out pretty okay if there are a few good influential teachers along the way. Thank you. Okay, my name is Jennifer Roberts Bruno, and so Dan Schwartz has been my thesis advisor, academic advisor, professor of three classes, including a graduate seminar, independent study advisor, mentor, and friend. I graduated in 2004, and we've kept in touch all these years. The love of English, reading, and writing from Dan's infectious enthusiasm has stayed with me all these years. I remember the first lecture I attended of Dan's on modernism and Balzac, and I was captivated. 
So much so that when I was traveling in Europe, I actually found pasta that was shaped like the monument to Balzac. And so I remember giving that to Dan, <laughs> and he was surprised and, and pleased. Um, the, the refreshingly original way he interwove modern literature, art history, philosophy, and literary criticism fascinated me. And I also loved the museum trips and opportunities to attend plays with other students. I have carried this passion Dan cultivated in me all these years, all, all the lessons I've learned from Dan, as I've taught English in Japan, attended Princeton and Yale for graduate school, taught writing at Brown University, and now at the U.S. Naval War College. Dan is truly extraordinary and has been my most influential teacher, and I am proud to call him my friend. This toast is all to him. He's too young to retire. Hi, my name is Tom Smith. I was a member of Dan's 1990 NEH Summer Seminar, along with about 10 or 11 others from across the country and, from, uh, and across what was then considered the only two genders. Dan schooled us in the latest varieties of post-structuralist thought, all the while fighting against its anti- or ahumanist positions, uh, as we've heard today. It was clear where Dan's commitments are and were in the culture wars that existed then in the academy. We read Lord Jim, and I would guess some other uh, uh, literary works, which I've now forgotten. But much of our time was spent coming to terms with, it must be said, this challenging or turgid criticism. Um, Dan was, and as we've heard today, is the consummate teacher. He got to know each of us quickly and well, treated us all uh, as equally having much potential, and entertained us with semi-weekly social events in local restaurants and at our respective dwelling places, including his own. And at the end of the seminar, we celebrated with our significant others, which he was careful to invite, at the Tunkhannock Inn across the lake. Uh, and I, I crossed it out, but I'll say, I thought that was a decidingly unhip place to have a final uh, meeting. But it, was, it, it is what it is. And I'm sure there are those who love it. Um, Dan pushed us, prodded us, flattered us, brought us up short when we needed it, and made us laugh regularly with his sly wit, and sometimes not so subtle, sotto voce asides, which of course we were meant to hear. <laughs> I'll always be grateful to Dan for his encouragement uh, for me at a time when I needed it, and for the help uh, he gave me in nurturing along an article on Conrad, which eventually got published in a good journal, I think through his help. Dan was and is the very model of a modern mentor, professional guide, loyal colleague, and friend to many, as the size of this group here today and tomorrow attests. But perhaps most of all, I'm grateful for his keeping me amused whenever I think of his clever euphemism for sex. Now, I'm not going to lower the tone tonight here by repeating it, but uh, you can ask Dan uh, what it is, and I'm sure he will, uh, he knows what it is, and he, he may tell you, he may not. If he refuses, then you can ask me tomorrow, and I'll share it with you. Hi, my name is Alicia Sovis, um, and Dan was my professor was my academic advisor and was my senior honors advisor. And I actually, 20-ish years ago, had the, um, had the honor of speaking when he received, I think it was the Weiss recognition. It could have been the Russell. You've gotten a lot of awards. But it is so great to be able to come back 20 years later and say, yeah, you really did make a difference. And thank you. Um, what was remarkable to me, especially, was he knew all of us. He saw all of us, and we keep hearing this over and over. Um, but he knew what we were up to outside of class, too. He showed up at every single performance and event I think I ever was in. And looking back at that, it must have been like having 60 kids and 60 different soccer teams and not missing a single game and still having time to take us to the museum and out for pizza with feta on it, which is weirdly good. <laughs> uh, and the enthusiasm he taught with and that he shared and worked so hard to share difficult texts and difficult ideas, and he wanted it to be accessible to all of us, um, that has really stuck with me. And one of my favorite memories that has really stayed with me and kind of changed the way I see the entire world is in a Ulysses seminar. And if I'm remembering correctly, your book was battered and held together with, I think, duct tape and prayer. 
and you had more writing in it than Joyce did. And we were having a discussion, and it was a lively discussion. Everyone was engaged, things were happening, and a student made an offhand comment about some tiny, tiny little phrase or word was referencing Stephen Dedalus's mother. Class stops, Dan stops, goes back to the book, opens the books, goes through the pages, takes a pencil, starts writing things down, jumps up, didn't realize that that tiny, tiny little piece, he had never seen it before, he found some little piece of joy in a book he knew so well. And not only did he not gloss over the fact that he didn't know it, which I think a lot of adults and professors would have pretended they had known the whole way or not paid attention, he found so much joy and expressed so much joy at finding something new in something he loves so much. And that's something I carry with me every day that I look for joy in little places where I might not find it. And that when I do find it, I celebrate that joy and I pay attention to it. And I taught for a while and I tried to pass that along to my students, I try to pass that along to my children. But I want you to know, every day, you have brought more joy into my life. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate you and how grateful I am to be able to say this tonight. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Wollstenholme. I wanted to say a few words because I thought I had a slightly different aspect of Dan's life to communicate. Um, it has to do with the scholarship, but it's beyond the academy. So many of the things we've heard had to, have had to do with his teaching here, graduate and undergraduate, uh, his NEH seminar, and so on. But Many scholars do not appreciate what goes on in communities around them, but I, I do think Dan does. Um, he, in the incident that I want to tell you about, this has to do with the time he reached out to the community. Now, let me give you just a little bit of background about myself. I came to Cornell, uh, I had my first master's degree, I was married with, with a child, I had been teaching for seven years in a community college and I was on sabbatical. And I started taking courses for my PhD, and I took a couple courses with Dan. Um, I've recently retired after 45 years of teaching in the community college. It was a difficult career, but it was a rewarding one as well. Um, and we've stayed in touch intermittently over these years. Every now and then, we'd, we'd have some contact. The story I want to tell has to do with what I think was our last contact before, before this occasion. It was Bloom's Day two years ago, right? You might not know this, but in central New York, there is a James Joyce Club. Um, they, it's just a, a group of people in the community. It's, it centers around Syracuse with kind of like about a 40 degree radius going up to Fulton and Watertown, um, uh, over, over to the east, not quite as far as Oneida. Uh, it's all over the place. But it, it used to meet a couple of times a month, and it has dwindled to maybe having meetings a couple of times a year and a couple of parties, believe me. Those Joyce people know how to party. Um, and, um, and so two years ago, they invited Dan to come and speak. Now, let me tell you, this club is not in the least scholarly. What they do is, might be a little shocking to some people in the English department, they sit around and literally rejoice to each other. That's what they do. Um, they have read Ulysses several times from cover to cover, Dubliners, I think they've even re read Finnegan's Wake uh, portrait, and when they get tired of reading Joyce, they read other Irish literature. They're mostly Irish, but not, you don't have to be Irish to join them. Dan came to speak on this Bloomsday. Bloomsday is one of the things they still do. And um, he was, the, the event was held in an Irish pub in Syracuse. So there's Dan, professor at Cornell University, speaking in this Irish pub. What was particularly striking to me about it was, first of all, your incredible generosity in coming to do that. Believe me, you had a very, very appreciative audience. They loved him. But what was especially interesting to me was that it was pitched perfectly. 
There was no condescension. There was no patronizing. It was intelligent, of course, and, um, and, and really gave everybody some wonderful insight, but it really was amazingly free of jargon or of anything that an intelligent reader wouldn't understand. Really appreciated that. Uh, Dan and I had time for a little conversation afterwards, and what I really was just noticing and really wanted to speak to was this generosity, his willingness to come, and his amazing sensitivity to his audience. All right, and the last one. My name's Hannah Carmen. I'm one of Dan's current graduate students. Um, I'm a compar comparative literature student, but uh, he's basically my chair. He converted me to modernism, which is a theme I've heard tonight. Um, but I actually didn't want to talk about myself. I wanted to talk about Dan, and I really wanted to talk about the humanism that he, I think he's taught everybody. And I don't think we hear enough of today in our culture. So I want to talk about John Stuart Mill, who was a 19th century philosopher, for those of you who remember, freshman year of college. John Stuart Mill was a brilliant student. He learned ancient Greek at the age of three, Latin at the age of eight, arithmetic, geometry, and logic at the age of 12, political thought at 13. His father, as you can imagine, was fairly strict. In 1826, at the age of 20, John Stuart Mill had a mental breakdown, uh, what he called a mental crisis, when he realized he had nothing left to live for. Okay, for the rest of the speech, I'm gonna be John Stuart Mill. In the interest of narratological uh, subtlety. John Stuart Mill found a solution to his problem of what was essentially depression. He, and that solution was Wordsworth. What made Wordsworth poems a medicine for my state of mind was, they, was that they expressed not mere outward beauty, but states of feeling. They seemed to be the very culture of feelings which I was in quest of. They I was in quest of, in them, what seemed to me to draw from a source of inward joy, of sympathetic and imaginative pleasure, which could be shared in by all human beings, which had no connection with struggle or imperfection, but would be made richer by every improvement in the physical, social condition of mankind. From them, I seemed to learn what would be my perennial source of happiness. And I do think the texts that Dan teaches are the perennial source of happiness for all of us. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. I'll end by saying I hope you enjoyed your meal. We are so pleased to have all of you here. The words of tribute are each so distinctive, diverse, rich, deep, and full of love and meaning. And I just want to say, want, have one more occasion to thank Dan for being here with us for 50 years and expect him to continue to have the kind of influence and exhibit the kind of commitment and the this, and this system of values that he's obviously instilled in all of you. Thanks, Dan. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.